Well, Alex reminded us next Sunday is a very special day. We are still just a little short of our goal. So if you can give above and beyond your regular offering to help us meet that goal, that will help us provide somewhere between 18 and 20,000 meals for children in some third world countries. And so please, we need your help next Sunday. We need the whole family together. Kids can be involved in this. Grandkids. Um, it's just, uh, you say, well, I don't know anything about packing meals. They, they teach us with a, a quick little training session on how to do it. It's real simple. Like I said, every age can be involved. So what we're going to do next Sunday after our service is over, we're going to go to the other side of the building, scarf down some pizza real quick, and then we're going to jump right into the uh, meal um, planning, the, the, the putting the meals together somewhere around 12, 15, uh, right after our service next, next Sunday. So please plan to stay for that. Two ways you can sign up on the table out front, but also you can detach the part of your bulletin that's detachable, sign your name on that and put it in the offering plates right after the service today. Jeff read from Luke chapter 10. If you have your Bibles, you know, we always go to the Word of God. It's the bread of life. You want to open up to that passage of Scripture this morning. And as you're opening up to that passage, let me remind you, it's been three years. I mean, it doesn't seem like it, but it's been three years. Three years ago, uh, this spring, our world came to a screeching halt, didn't it? Three years ago, this spring, everything stopped all of a sudden, we came to a standstill with the COVID shutdown three years ago this spring. Now, here's a picture of a New York City street now, nowadays, right? right? And you think going to Walmart on Friday afternoon is a bad thing, right? How would you like to be stuck in that? Here was a picture of New York City three years ago in the streets there. Can you believe it? You know, everything came to a halt, and as a result, seismologists discovered some amazing outcomes. As places went into lockdown, the Earth's buzz became a whisper. They're looking back now and talking about some things that happened. Suddenly, their sensitive equipment could detect activity from small earthquakes that normally would have been masked by human vibrations. They even discovered that during the time of stillness, the Earth's crust back then, three years ago, was moving a little less. One seismologist at the National Autonomous University of Mexico said the stillness enabled them to detect seismic signals they didn't even know existed. He went on to say that this finding may be one of the only positive things that came out of the global pandemic, the ability to better detect future earthquakes. In other words, everything coming to a sudden halt three years ago enabled us to hear things, some important things, often lost in all the noise, just a little bit better. But that shouldn't surprise us, right? Because thousands of years ago, much longer than three years ago, God gave us this word from Psalm 46 and verse 10. Just be still and know that I am God. In other words, sometimes you have to halt before you can hear. You have to slow down before you can listen up. We're in this series entitled The One Thing. Over the next few weeks, we started it last Sunday. We're looking into the New Testament passage of Scripture that use that phrase, the, the one thing. Blind man Jesus Hill says, one thing I know. The Apostle Paul from a prison says, this one thing we do, being persecuted for his faith. Last week, we began with a rich young ruler who was warned by Jesus, one thing you lack. And this morning, we meet a woman named Martha who was told only one thing is needed, a woman who needed to halt so she could hear. And her encounter with Jesus takes place in a little village called Bethany in Luke chapter 10. Leading up to his visit in this home, Jesus has been traveling different places about a year and a half, Galilee and surrounding areas, and now he's back in Judea, and he makes a beeline for this home that was very special to him. It's in the little village of Bethany. We have a map here that can show you where that was at. See Jerusalem there. On down, you see Bethlehem at the bottom. Bethany's just a couple of miles or so away from Jerusalem, and it still exists today. Now, Jesus had some very special friends in his life. He had the 12 apostles, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and the rest of them that he spent every day with. But beyond that, there was another circle of friends that were two sisters and a brother. Mary, not his mother Mary, this is a different Mary, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. 
They lived in this little village outside of Bethany, which I said still exists today. Martha owned the home, and Jesus seemed to love hanging out there. I don't know, maybe they had a guest room for him, and, and Jesus used it from time to time and, and appreciated it deeply. But of all the people that Jesus interacted with in his three-year teaching ministry, there's only one person I know of that he zeroed in on, and he said, hey, basically, hang on. I think you're overwhelmed. You're stressed out here. You're exhausted. And I think we need to sort through this thing together. You need to halt so you can hear. You need to be still and know that I am God. And it's his friend, the owner of this home in Luke chapter 10, whose name is Martha. There was a phrase somebody coined several years ago, and it said, beware of the barrenness, the emptiness, the barrenness of an empty, busy life. We want our lives to be full of the words and wisdom of Jesus, but it's like his voice gets lost in all the noise, Right? Don't you know there's just all this noise at your job, the overtime, the ball fields, the weekend trips, the travel team, the kids' schedule, the kids, the TV, Facebook, and about a hundred other clamoring sounds emanating from our world. Someone said it's not so much how busy you are, but why you're busy and what you're busy about. See, the ant is admired, but the fly is swatted, and they're both busy. Beware of the barrenness of just having a busy life. It's like this. You know, if I were to preach the message today with my arms around my, my neck like this, it would be irritating to me and also to you. But it's like we go through life like this. We have so much going on that God gets crowded out by all the noise. In the parable of the sower, it's called the thorns choking, squeezing the life out of you. Now, in the story of Mary and Martha here, we have this scene that unfolds for us, it's a simple story, but it packs a powerful message. So let's unfold the story here in Luke chapter 10. Jeff's already read it, but we'll sort of just kind of go back over it. Jesus shows up at Martha's home, and her sister Mary pulls up a chair. And I can imagine Mary saying something like, hey, Jesus, I'm so glad you stopped by. How's it been on the road? You know, what have you had to deal with the pain of those Pharisees and how they've been lately? You can tell me, Jesus, you know, we're friends. What you share in Bethany stays in Bethany. I'm so glad you're here. I'm glad to be catching up with you and listening to what you have to teach here. So they're catching up together, and perhaps Jesus is even teaching like I said, and meanwhile, her sister Martha runs into the kitchen to get a meal going. So there's no worries, right? Mary's with the guest, Jesus. Martha's getting things ready. It's all good. But as Jeff read to us this morning, not so fast, my friend. Here's a great example of what happens when you're going 90 miles an hour and we're trying to do too much and we get all stressed out and we don't slow down to listen up. What usually happens? We get cranky, we get irritated, we get anxious. We end up blowing a gasket over something that shouldn't bother us that much at all. And it's because we're stressed, we're tired, we're depleted. Look what happens in the story here in Luke chapter 10. Martha is like the, she's like the Betty Crocker of Bethany, okay? She wants everything just right. Her last name may have been Stewart, I don't know. But after a few minutes of running around 90 miles an hour without help, Martha snaps. She blows a gasket. She's ticked. The pot on the stove is not the only thing that's boiling. Martha's fuming. I can just picture her kneading the dough and imagining it's her sister Mary. I'm glad someone's having fun, she grunts as she works through that dough vigorously. She thinks she's the guest. We could have gotten this done in half the time if she was in here instead of just out there laying around. Another fist into the dough. Why is he letting her sit there like that? How am I going to feed this army of men? I wish I could sit down for a while. Sure would be nice. All I do around here is cook and clean and sweep and sweep and sweep some more. Perhaps maybe first she shoots a little look at, at Mary. You know the look I'm talking about, the kind of eye contact that says, I'm mad and you're had and you better get in here and help me. I can picture her even dropping pans out in the kitchen, you know, to signal her upsetness about it. Maybe she sighs. <sighs> You ever done that, ladies? Kind of sigh a little bit. But when Mary doesn't take the hint, she bursts into the conversation that her sister is having with Jesus in the other room, and boy, is she ticked. Let me ask you, have you ever been mad at someone over here and taken it out on somebody over here? Huh? Just asking. Come on now. 
I know I'm going from preaching into meddling when I ask that, though. Yeah, that's Martha, though. She doesn't lambaste Mary. She addresses Jesus straight on. And notice her first words out of her mouth. It's right there in verse 40. She says, Lord, don't you care? <laughs> don't you care? How ironic is that to ask Jesus? Don't you care? Jesus is the one who's left heaven's splendor to put on human flesh, to bleed and die on the cross for the redemption of the world. He's been out on the road teaching until he's absolutely exhausted. And now Martha's sort of beating him up with words saying, you're a cold, uncompassionate person. Don't you care? But then it gets worse there. If you look at the verse again, verse 40, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all this work by myself? And Martha's just getting warmed up. I picture her maybe having a spatula in her hand as she enters into the room. And maybe she gets right up close to Jesus with that spatula. You tell her to help me. You listen to me, Jesus. Order that lazy sister of mine into the kitchen before I do something on Peter's head with this spatula, you know. Don't you care? My sister's a deadbeat. Domino's pizza won't deliver. Your disciples are mooches. They won't do the dishes. You ever feel that way? Poor old me. Notice how many times she says, me, myself, me, four times. Personal pronouns. Someone said one time, too much eyesight, not this eyesight. Me, eyesight, gives a distorted view of life when all I can see is myself. Now remember the location of the two sisters. Martha's been out in the kitchen. Mary's been at Jesus' feet. Now think about how would you describe Martha here. She's distracted, worried, hassled, stressed, upset, anxious, mad at everybody, resentful. She's telling God and the flesh what to do. So let me ask you, do you think it's a mere coincidence that the one most anxious and most stressed out and most full of ang anger in the story is the one who at this time is farthest away from Jesus? Martha's like this. Let's put this picture up there. You know, you got a bucket, and you ever feel that way? Your bucket's leaking out all your strength and all your joy and all your peace, and you're depleted from the contents of your bucket just being leaked out in 30 different directions? You know, in fact, well, here's the next picture. Maybe we could bring this one up. You know, that's a good question to ask. How full is your bucket? Is it half full? Is it is three quarters? Is it a quarter full? Is it barely full? Is it depleted? Where is the level and why is the level there? What's draining you? Where is all the water of life going? And what does that low level of bucket look like in your life? Are you short with others? Are you resentful? Are you angry? Are you worried? Are you anxious? Are you mad at everybody and everyone in your path? See, the question to be raised is, what is your life like when your bucket is full, and what is your life like when the bucket is empty? See, the difference here between angry and anxious Martha and peace-filled, joy-filled, content Mary. As a follower of Jesus in a world that seeks to drain you, tire you, exhaust you, defeat you, the best thing you can bring to the table is a filled-up bucket filled by spending time with Jesus. So there's Mary at Jesus' feet listening. Martha, picture her spatula in hand. She's just stirred the pot. And I imagine everyone grows quiet. You could t cut the tension with that carving knife that Martha has in her apron probably. And Jesus responds, now if I'm Jesus here and Martha comes at me like this, you're going to get a little defensive, aren't you? I think it's probably good that I'm not Jesus. And you ought to be thankful for that every day, right? Do you notice Jesus' reaction here? He doesn't escalate. He doesn't say, hey, uh, lady, don't you know who you're talking to? He doesn't even say, okay, come on, Mary, let's go. Let's all pitch in and give Martha a hand. That would just put a Band-Aid on the issue. The problem's not in Martha's house. The problem's in Martha's heart. So Jesus slices through the silence. Look at verse 41. He just simply says, Martha, Martha which in first century lingo is back the truck up, okay? <laughs> just, just back it up. Easy does it. Slow down. Take a chill pill here. And then he kindly says in verse 41 and verse 42, Martha, you're worried about so many things, upset about so many things, but few things are needed. Or indeed, only one. There's our phrase. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from you. Only one thing is needed. 
Martha, you're worried and upset about so many things here. Only one thing is, and it's not that loaf of bread you're baking. It's me. I'm the bread of life. And Mary's chosen what's better, and that will not be taken away from her. And so, you know, you can look at this story, and you can underline some different phrases in there. The contrast, you could underline many things as opposed to one thing. Martha's pulled in so many different directions, she forgets the one who gives direction for it all, Jesus. She's sort of like the New York family that bought a ranch out west where they intended to raise cattle, and the friends came to visit and asked if the ranch had a name. And the father said, well, I wanted to call it the Bar J. My wife wanted to call it the Susie Q. One of my sons wanted to call it the Flying W. And my other son wanted to call it the Lazy Y. So we compromised, and we called it the Bar J, Susie Q, Flying W, Lazy Y Ranch. And his friend said, well, where's all the cattle? He goes, we don't have any. None of them survived the branding. You know, there's just too many, too many things can snuff out the one most important thing. And check out the phrase. Look at verse 42. Mary has chosen what is better. You know what my problem in in life is sometimes? It's not so much choosing between what is bad and good. Sometimes that's not the battle. My battle sometimes, and maybe it's your battle, is choosing between what's okay and what's best. The real battle in life comes down to choosing between sometimes, sometimes, good, better, and best. The Apostle Paul had a prayer for the Christians in the city of Philippi in that church, and here's what he said in Philippians chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. My prayer is that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ when he comes back to take us home. See, here's the thing. If the devil can't make you bad, he's just going to make you busy. He wants you to have so many, like we said last week, so many irons in the fire that when it comes to God, the fire just sort of dies out and at least it's reduced to embers. He'll take all the good things, all the okay things, you know, gradually suffocate out the best thing, your relationship with Jesus Christ. Someone put a picture together about it here with Mary and Martha. Uh, and, and Martha's the one that's got so many things emanating from her life and her thoughts here, whether it's, you know, today would be work and education and the world problems and money problems and a crowded schedule and family issues and kids and aging parents. And Martha's, first and foremost, it's Jesus. All the other things come in light of it. Maybe we could picture it this way. Your life, my life, every day is being directed either by the compass or the clock. The clock represents all the stuff, the schedules, the appointments, how you fill up your time with activity and busyness, but the compass represents your values, your principles, your convictions, people God's called you to love. Often there's a gap between the two, so the story is calling us to halt so we can hear. We've got to live by the compass and not just have a life governed by the clock. Mary's living by the compass, Jesus Maybe she's got all of all of her preparations done before Jesus arrived, I don't know. Or maybe she realized that hot rolls and mashed potatoes without lumps were not nearly as important as getting to know Jesus. She sorted through the, the, the many things and first chose the one thing, him. When our kids were little, you know what, I was thinking about this story. I often felt a lot like Martha, going 90 miles an hour, like some of you parents are right now, going to the ball field, the gym, the school programs, the extracurricular activities, the vacations, the trips. And I have to confess, I look back now, and I wish I would have stopped more, come to a halt so as to have ears to hear, to schedule in more time just with the Lord. Because, well, here's the thing. Maybe the Lord would want to say this to us right here. What's a good thing that's become a bad thing because it's keeping you from the best thing, him, or as Jesus would say, me. I'm not saying you have to put all these other things behind you. I'm just saying here's the thing. There's some things we need to put behind him. So maybe what we need to do is just stop and halt and be still and hear what Jesus is saying and simply pray, Father, help me discern what changes I need to make to have a closer walk with you. I don't know. Maybe Jesus' words to Martha are really his words to you. You're worried and upset about so many things in your life. You're missing the one thing. That's me. Start with me. Martha, you're doing all this stuff around me, but you're missing something, your relationship with me. You know, if I wanted, Jesus could have said, if I wanted a five-star dinner, I could have arranged one. 
I just fed the 5,000 with some loaves and fish. Martha, you heard the story about me turning the water and the wine at a wedding reception. I mean, I could turn this whole place into Golden Corral if I wanted to, Martha. Martha, the one thing that I'm looking for you right now is relationship. Unrushed, unhurried, time together. Martha, there's more, something more important than just busyness. It's nearness. Nearness. Let's call that our one significant, or maybe a better word would be our one essential need, developing a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Do you know him as your Lord and your Savior? Are you spending time with him? Are you close to him? Picture it this way. A wife says to a husband, do do you really love me? What kind of question is that? I mow the grass, I take out the trash, I provide for the kids, I repaired the sink last week. How could you ask, do I love you? Look at all the things I do for you. But then she asks maybe, but you never really seem to want to spend much time with me. See, it's not that the things you do for Jesus don't matter. Don't get me wrong. Just don't measure your love for him, your relationship with him, by the things you do for him. It's a relationship. How do I get to know someone if I ever seldom spend time with them. The issue is, am I falling in love with the one who loves me more than I could ever imagine? Sometimes I'm tempted to think, if I just do some church stuff, and maybe in my mind I get this mental checklist, okay, I've showed up on Sunday morning, I gave my tithe, I, 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 I come for the service project, I work in vacation Bible school, I'm there for the meal togetherness that we're doing next week. I'm just, and I have all these things. I check off this religious activity list. If I just give Jesus all these presents of my time and money, that's what it's all about. Now, don't misunderstand me. Those things are good. I mean, there's times we need to be Martha. In fact, just before this story with Mary and Martha, Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. And somebody had to be a Martha there to come and help that guy who's along the road and bandage him up. And there's times we have to do that. But I'm not saying the Christian life is just sitting and learning about Jesus. If everybody is just a Mary and you don't have Martha's, then nothing gets done, right? You need to have Martha times in your life. Next Sunday's one of those Martha times. If nobody shows up, the, the needy kid's don't get fed. So don't get me wrong. Here's the challenge. Here's the challenge. Don't let your presence for Jesus take the place of the presence of Jesus. Let me, let me show you this picture. I got to see this up close when we were overseas a, a few years ago. That's the Michelangelo painting in the Sistine Chapel. And it's picturing heaven touching a human being. The hand of heaven being God's, the other hand being Adam's. And you look at that picture and you imagine, you know, the human being uh, who's, who's on the left of that picture reaching out and, 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 and grabbing God's hand and hanging onto it tightly. Just imagine that hand reaching out a couple more inches and grabbing hold of God's hand. I, I wanted to show that to you because the single most bucket-filling dynamic in my life is when I'm firmly hand in hand with God. When I feel his love, when I'm in his word, when I'm spending time in prayer, his spirit is working in my life, when I'm in conversations with him throughout the day and I'm sensing his leading and I'm trying to be present and responsive to needs that I see, when I'm really in great sincere relationship with God, it's the most single bucket filling dynamic experience in my life. But the confession is this. I don't spend enough time doing that. Jesus put it like this in John chapter 15. He said, I'm the vine and you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you'll bear much fruit. Your life will be fruitful. But remember this, apart from him, you can do nothing. So what do I do with this? How do I wrap a bow around this? How do, I, how do I take this home? Here's the question. What's keeping you from getting closer and closer to, to the Lord Jesus Christ, spending more time with him? What's preventing you from choosing spiritual maturity in your life? Someone shared this years ago. Someone gave it to me. This is not original with me. In fact, you might remember me sharing this with you one time before. But think of it in terms of four math symbols. We're going to go to the math classroom here. Everybody, school's out, but we're going back to it just in a moment, okay? The first one is the addition sign. 
Is there something you need to add to your life? Maybe it's a prayer partner that will help you be more accountable. Maybe it's time in God's word every day, just getting up a little earlier and getting, uh, reading through a chapter, underlining, J- just time with Jesus every day, listening as he speaks to you from this word. Maybe it's today the first step of going into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, accepting him as your Lord and Savior, placing your faith and your trust in him, turning away from sin and repentance, being baptized into him. Is there something you need to subtract? That's the next sign. Uh, Take away a relationship that's pulling you down, a negative influence, a group of friends, some bucket drainers, getting away from a certain group of people, an enslaving habit in your life, a sin that's continually taking you down. Maybe it's one or two or three of the 90 things you've got going on that's running you ragged. Maybe it's a good thing that's become a bad thing because it's taking you away from the best thing, Jesus. Is this, next, this next sign is the greater than sign. Is there something you need to increase your commitment to Sunday worship with the church, your time in prayer every day where you just spend time talking to Jesus, some healthy amount of time spent with bucket fillers, people who love Jesus that will help you love Jesus even more? What is the one activity that you know of, if you did consistently, you would have positive results from it in your walk with God. What is that one activity? And if you know it, why aren't you doing it? And here's the last one, the, the, the decrease, the, the less than sign. What is there that you need to have less of in your life? Maybe, you've got to be honest, maybe it's Less time just wasting away watching television or on social media. Do you really need six hours a day on Facebook or computer uh, computer time worrying about everything that comes along instead of praying about it? Do you you ever feel like this picture? Go ahead and bring it up, guys. There it is. And you're just going through life every day like that. And you're just trying to carry everything you can along the way. So much baggage. What's going to change What bags do you need to make smaller or to quit carrying altogether to move forward in your walk with God? Maybe most of the bags are all right things. They're good things. But they've weighed you down so much you've dropped the best thing, a close relationship with Jesus. What are the all right things that have you allowed to become a bad thing because it's keeping you from the best thing, Christ? Bailey Hemphill was a softball player for the University of Alabama during the 2017 season. While at the plate during their, one of their biggest rivals, SEC rivals, rivals, Ole Miss, on May 1st of that season, Bailey scorched a game-tying home run. Here's a picture of her being greeted by her teammates as she rounds the bases and heads for home. What you do not see in the picture, she's leaping in the air, Bailey distracted by all the activity of her teammates with her arms in the air in the midst of the celebration and the hoopla. Bailey forgot one thing, the most important thing, touching home plate. The umpire gave the ball to the catcher who promptly tagged her out, as you can see in this next picture I think we have, before she could come back and touch home, and she was called out. Alabama ended up losing the game by one run. I was thinking about that story when I heard it, and I saw it actually replayed on television, and I was thinking, you know, with all the stuff going on and all the distractions, with all the running around, all the people in our life, all the excitement, don't forget to keep the main thing the main thing. Don't miss home. And don't forget spending time with and falling in love with the only one who can get you there. His name is Jesus, and he loves you so much. Let's pray.